A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man by James Joyce James Joyce, the 20th century's most influential novelist, was born in Dublin on February 2, 1882, the oldest of ten children. He grew up in a family that went from prosperity to penury because of his father's pastoral behavior. After receiving a rigorous Jesuit education, 20-year-old Joyce renounced his Catholicism and left Dublin in 1902 to spend most of his life as a writer in exile in Paris, Trist, Rome, and Zurich. On one trip back to Ireland, he fell in love with the now famous Nora Barnacle on a June 60, the day he later chose as a bloomsday in his novel Ulysses. Nora was an uneducated Galway girl who became his lifelong companion and the mother of his two children. In debt and drinking heavily, Joyce lived for 36 years on a contained, supporting himself first by teaching jobs, then through the patronage of Miss Harold McCormick and the English feminist and editor Harriet Shaw Weaver. His writing include Chamber Music in 1907, Dubliners in 1940, a portrait of the artist as a young man in 1960, Exiles in 1980, Ulysses in 1922, Palm Spinach in 1927, Finangas Awake in 1939, and an early draft of the portrait of the artist as a young man, Stephen Harrow, in 1944. Ulysses required seven years to complete, and his masterpiece, Finangus Wake, took 17. Both works revolutionized the form, structure, and content of the novel. Joyce died in Zurich, in 1941. This Bantam classic edition of the portrait of the artist as a young man is received from the first American edition published on a December 29, year 1960 by B. W. Hobbs. Also made up from the American sheets because English printers would not accept the responsibility for printing the text. Chapter 1 Once upon a time, and a very good time it was, there was a moo cow coming down along the road, and this moo cow that was down along the road met a nice sense little boy named Baby Taco. His father told him that story. His father looked at him through a glass. He had a hairy face. He was baby taco. The moo cow came down the road where Betty Byrne lived. She sold lemon plat. Oh, the wild rose blossoms on the little green place. He sang that song, that was his song. Oh, the green wood booters. When you wet the bed, first it was warm, then it get cold. His mother put on the old sheet that had the queer smell. His mother had a nicer smell 
than his father. She played on a piano the sailor hornpipe for him to dance. He danced tra la 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 tra la 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 tra la 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 lady tra la 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 tra la 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 Uncle Charles and Dante clapped. They were older than his father and mother. But Uncle Charles was older than Dante. Dante had two brushes in her press. The brush with the maroon velvet back was for Michael Davids and the brush with the green velvet back was for Parnell. Dante gave him a casho every time he brought her a piece of the tissue paper. The Wakens live in a number seven. They had a different father and mother. They were ailing father and mother. When they were grown up, he was going to marry Aileen. He hid under the table. His mother said, Oh, Stefan, we'll apologize. Dante said, Oh, if not, the eagles will come and pull out his eyes. Pull out his eyes, apologize, apologize, pull out his eyes, apologize, pull out his eyes, pull out his eyes, apologize. The white playground were swarming with boys. All were shooting and the prefects urged them on with strong cries. The evening air was pale and chilly. And after every charge and thought of the footballers, the greasy leather orb flew like a heavy bird through the gray light. He kept on the fringe of his line, out of the sight of his perfect, out of his reach of the rude feet, beginning to run now and then. He felt his body small and weak amid the throng of players and his eyes were weak and watery. Rowdy Kickham was not like that. He would be captain of the third line, all the flow said. Rowdy Kickham was a decent flow, but Nasty Roach was a stink. Rowdy Kickham had a grips in his number and a hamper in the refectory. Nasty Roach has a big hands. He called the Friday pudding down in a blanket. And one day he asked, What's your name? Stephen had answered, Stephen Dedalus. The nasty roach has said, what kind of name is that? And when Stephen had not been able to answer, nasty roach had asked, what is your father? Stephen had answered, a gentleman. The nasty roach had asked, is he magistrate? He crept about a form point to point on a fringe of his line, making little runs now and then. But his hands were bluish with cold. He kept his hand in a side pocket of his belted gray suit. That was a belt round his pocket. And belt was also to give a fellow a belt. One day a flow had said to Cantwell, I'd give you such a belt in a second. Cantwell had answered, Go and fight your match. Give Cecil Thunder a belt. I'd like to see you, 
he'd give you a two in a romper for yourself. That was not a nice expression. His mother had told him not to speak with the rough boys in a college. Nice mother. The first day in the hall of the castle, when she had said goodbye, she had put up her veil double to her nose to kiss him. And her nose and eyes were red. But he had pretended not to see that she was going to cry. She was a nice mother. But she was not so nice when she cried. And his father had given him two five-shilling pieces for pocket money. And his father had told him if he wanted anything to write home to him and whatever he did, never to pitch on a fellow. Then at the door of the castle, the rector had shaken hands with his father and mother, his suiting fluttering in a breeze, and the car had driven off with his father and mother on it. They had cried to him from the car, waving their hands. Goodbye, Stephen, goodbye. Goodbye, Stephen, goodbye. He was coughed in a wheel of the scrimmage and fearful of the flashing eyes and moody butts. Bent down to look through the legs. The fellows were struggling and groaning, and their legs were rubbing and kicking and stamping. Then Jack Lafton's yellow boots dodged out the ball, and all the other boots and legs ran after. He ran after them a little way and then stopped. It was useless to run on. Soon they would be going home for holidays. After supper in a study hall, he would change the number past it up inside his desk from 77 to 76. It would be better to be in a study hall than out there in a cold. The sky was pale and cold but there were lights in a castle he wondered from which window hamilton rowan had thrown his hat on the haha and had there been flow beds at the time under the window one day when he had been called on the castle the builder had shown him the marks of the soldiers' slacks in a wood of the door and had given him a piece of the short bird that the community ate. It was nice and warm to see the lights in a castle. It was like something in a book. Perhaps Lester Abbey was like that. And there were nice sentences in a Dr. Carnival spelling book. They were like poetry, but they were only sentences to learn and spelling from. All say that in a Lester Abbey, where the abbots buried him. Canker is a disease of the plants. Cancer, one of animals. It would be nice to lie on a hearth rock before the fire, leaning his head upon his hands and think on those sentences. He shivered as if he had a cold, slimy water next to his skin. That was mean of wells to shoulder him into the square ditch because he would not soap his little 
snuff books. For wealth, season it, hacking chestnut. The Conquer of Forty How cold and slimy the water had been. A fellow had once seen a big rat jump into the scone. Mother was sitting at the fire with Dante waiting for Bridget to bring in the tea. She had her feet on a fender and her jewelry slippers were so hot and they had such a lovely warm smell. Dante knew a lot of things. She had taught him where the Mozambique Channel was and what was the longest river in America and what was the name of the highest mountain in the moon. Father Arnold knew more than Dante because he was a priest, but both his father and uncle Charles said that Dante was a clever woman and a well-read woman. And when Dante made that noise after dinner and then put up her hand to her mouth, that her heart born. A voice cried far out on a playground. All in! Then other voices cried from the lower and third lines, All in! All in! The players clasped around. Flushed and muddy. And he went among them, glad to go in. Ruddy Kickham held the ball by its greasy lace. A fellow asked him, to give it one last. But he walked on without even answering the fellow. Simon Moonan told him not to, because the prefect was looking. The fellow turned to Simon Moonan and said, We all know why you speak. You are a Mac Glad Sock. Suck was a queer word. The fellow called Simon Moonan that name because Simon Moonan used to tie the prefect false sleeves behind his back and the prefect used to let on to be angry. But the sound was ugly. Once he had washed his hands in the lavatory of the Wicklow Hotel and his father pulled the strapper up by the chain after the dirty water went down through the hole in the basin. And when it had all gone down slowly, the hotel in a basin had made the sound like that. Suck, only louder. To remember that and the white look of the lavatory made him feel cold and then hot. There were two cocks that you turned and water came out, cold and hot. He felt cold and then a little hot. And he could see the names printed on a cocks. That was a very quiet thing. And the air in a corridor chilled him too. It was queer and wettish. But soon the gas would be lit and burning it made the light nose like a little song. Always the same. And when the Phillips stopped talking in the playroom you could hear it. It was a horror for Psalms. Father Arnold wrote a hard Psalms on a board and then said, Now then, who will win? Go ahead, York. Go ahead, Lancaster. This video is made for Navidaria Page.